Europe, NATO ambassadors are meeting in an emergency meeting in Brussels for uh, their decisions and their reaction and possible action as a result of what's uh, taken place today. Uh, still a lot of uh, suggestions as to what uh, might have happened, in other words, who may have been behind this. Uh, for the latest on, on what some of that thinking may be, we're joined by uh, someone who's familiar to uh, many of our viewers on days like this. Neil Livingston is one of uh, the top uh, terrorism experts uh, in the United States, and his uh, commentary is watched closely uh, by a lot of people. Uh, Neil Livingston joins us by telephone from Washington right now. Mr. Livingston, uh, you've had a chance now to, uh, to look at uh, the various things that have happened today, heard from a, a number of people, I'm sure. What's your sense? Well, this was the uh, terrorist attack that we've always dreaded, which is a multiplicity of attacks uh, against a multiplicity of high-consequence targets. Uh, it was something that we knew was possible, and uh, it's come to pass. That said, there's only a very small number of terrorist groups in the world that have the capability of carrying out such a well-coordinated, uh, skillful action. And, of course, there are some governments in the world uh, as well, and those have not escaped notice uh, at this time. So the FBI, the U.S. intelligence community, and so on, have a relatively short list of uh, suspects at this time. What is your... Uh, are, are, you, you've heard, as I'm sure, that some people are, are already pointing fingers at, uh, at one of the uh, possible... Uh, people involved here, Osama bin Laden, based on uh, other events of the past. What's your thinking on that front? Well, Osama bin Laden is at the top of everyone's list right now. Uh, he, of course, was uh, behind the bombings of our embassies in East Africa, behind the bombing of the USS Cole. He's re repeatedly stated that he would carry out uh, massive attacks against the United States. We believe that the near attack that occurred during the millennium, where we had uh, uh, terrorists that had come to Canada, and uh, we're going to cross over our border uh, with explosive components and so on. We're also uh, at least indirectly connected with bin Laden. So uh, everyone is looking in that direction right now. That said, uh, uh, at this point, uh, we really can't stop uh, uh, looking at other groups as well. And some of the key clues they're looking at right now is that we believe that the pilots uh, of all four aircraft certainly three of them, that they had actual terrorist pilots in the cockpit, that the pilots were probably shot or incapacitated so quickly that, at least according to our reports now, that none were able to alert authorities uh, with the panic button that is in the cockpit that they've been hijacked. And uh, those were very skillfully piloted planes, at least, the two that went into the World Trade Center. So that, that limits uh, the number of people who could have those skills to fly a 767. And uh, they're going over the manifest of the aircraft right now, looking for people who were recently arrived in the United States and looking for those that might have had some type of aviation training. What is your sense of how the American government has reacted in an official way so far? It's been seven hours, a little over seven hours now, uh, since the first aircraft hit the World Trade Center. We have heard a couple of comments from the president. He's now, in, we're told, in a bunker in Omaha. Uh, we've heard just now from Karen Hughes. What is your sense of the kind of reaction that we're hearing in an official way from the U.S. government so far? Well, the first concerns right now are, are for the victims of the, uh, of the catastrophic attacks. And uh, at the same time, uh, virtually every possible uh, intelligence and other uh, uh, source in the world is being contacted. Uh, we're going back and looking at intelligence take from the past many days, weeks, and months, because sometimes what is apparent to us in the aftermath is not apparent at the beginning. And so they're, they're trying to see if something was missed that would point uh, the finger at uh, those responsible. What we do know here is that this will be the defining moment of the Bush administration. Uh, if he acts too hesitantly, too passively, doesn't act uh, swiftly or strongly enough for the uh, uh, American people, uh, his will not be a successful presidency. If he acts uh, decisively but uh, with uh, what the American people feel is, uh, is coolness and so on, getting our economy back up, getting our aviation system back up and so on, and then uh, and dealing with those responsible, then he may go down as a very successful president. But we're at war, and he's a wartime president now.
Do you assume that something has to happen and happen quickly in terms of a response from the U.S.? I think it's going to be very difficult to contain American public opinion uh, if there is reasonable belief, uh, maybe not court probative belief, but uh, reasonable certainty intelli from intelligence sources or from allies as to who was behind this. I think the United States needs to demonstrate that uh, it is going to respond uh, overwhelmingly uh, and in a, in, a, in a very, very uh, uh, significant way. Uh, against governments that were harboring these people or against governments themselves. Uh, any go government that doesn't cooperate with the United States. I, I cannot imagine uh, being allowed to, uh, to uh, not have some type of retaliation for that right now. As you know, the president is convening a, uh, a national security conference call right now from, right. from Omaha. Who will be the, the defining voices in that conversation right now? What, what would you expect the the discussion, who would the discussion be led by? Well, the discussion will probably be led by the President's National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice, and by Vice President Cheney, uh, both uh, uh, longtime uh, military and foreign policy uh, hands, uh, whose uh, uh, balanced judgment and, uh, and uh, opinions will be sought uh, by or will be uh, viewed with great uh, import by other members uh, of the National Security Council. Obviously, the Defense Secretary, Don Rumsfeld, will be asked uh, whether his uh, intelligence uh, resources uh, know anything at this point. What steps are they taking to ensure further protection of the United States? Uh, Norman Mineta, the Transportation Secretary, will be very intimately involved because all four incidents involved aircraft. and. Uh, the Department of Transportation has authority in that area. And, of course, the CIA director, George Tennant. These will probably be the principal voices that, you, that, will, uh, that will carry the day, but ultimately the decisions will be the president's. You know, we, we are led to believe, whether it's through uh, history or through movies, uh, that at times like this, in that room, there, there, are, there are a group that could be described as hawks, in other words, going, demanding action right away. Others, uh, doves, if, for lack of a, a better word, who might say, listen, we don't know enough yet. If that's the kind of group of people we have on the phone with the president right now, who would they be on either side of the issue? Well, I think uh, Vice President Cheney has a reputation of being very decisive. Um, I, I'm not sure that any member of the cabinet is going to recommend going ahead without, with military action or some type of uh, political action without uh, reasonable certainty who the culprits are. But I think you will uh, find advocates and a strong response from, uh, uh, from Mr. Cheney and Mr. Rumsfeld uh, in particular. Uh, I think uh, Colin Powell will probably urge uh, more caution. Uh, I think that Condoleezza Rice will probably be on, uh, on the cautious side. But that isn't to say that, I, uh, that I'm uh, uh, suggesting that the, the vice president will recommend something rash, but I do think that there will be those that are more predisposed to military or some other type of drastic action. And uh, uh, I think members of Congress right now, too, will be consulted. And I know there's a, an enormous groundswell amongst the American people that's just absolute outrage across the country. And I don't think that will fade quickly, and I think the Congress will be in the forefront, as John McCain and others have called for today, uh, 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 very drastic action in this case, military action, uh, the sense that the United States is at war. Perhaps the key words you expressed there were reasonable certainty, and sometimes, as we've witnessed in the past, it can take a long time years sometimes of investigation before there's reasonable certainty as to who was responsible for actions like this, although there's never been an action like this. Um, but it's sounding to me like you're suggesting that they don't have years to make a response to this. There will not be years to make a response. I think it will be days or weeks at the most. Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, however, is generally we've had intelligence or other information that has pointed very strongly in the direction of certain culprits after every terrorist attack. What we haven't had in some cases is court probative information. In other words, information you could take in a court of law where you've got all the T's crossed, all the, dies, all the I's dotted. And I think in this case you can have 99% certainty, but some of it may come from very sensitive intelligence sources 
uh, that you really c couldn't bring into an open courtroom. And I think if we have that type of certainty uh, from our intelligence sources, that I think the U.S. government will probably take action predicated upon that. Are there dangers of mistakes being made when emotions are running as high as they are right now? There are always uh, dangers of, uh, of, of mistakes being made, and I think that uh, uh, as the U.S. is able to catch its breath, hopefully tomorrow or the next day, uh, and that we don't suffer from other terrorist attacks or that our allies don't suffer from other terrorist attacks in the meantime, that, um, uh, that we will make certain that, uh, that the proper culprits are identified. But, but I, I, I think the real issue here is that if, if indeed this leads to bin Laden, I, I, I don't see how we can allow the Taliban to survive in Afghanistan, whatever it takes. If, if the trail leads to Damascus or some other place where a group has been harbored, I think you'll see the United States perhaps give ultimata to various uh, nations that they must surrender these people very, very quickly or face massive attack. Uh, uh, once we have a fixed blame, I don't think that legal niceties will stand in the way of uh, U.S. action at that point. Neil Livingston uh, joining us once again uh, from Washington on uh, a terrible day for the United States. We appreciate your expertise in uh, trying to help us understand what happened here today and what may happen in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, update you on uh, more of the reaction here in Canada. Premier John Hamm of Nova Scotia has just given uh, a news conference as well uh, as a result of uh, the terrible situation in the United States and specifically as we continue to monitor the pictures live out of New York City now uh, a little more than uh, seven hours after the uh, first aircraft hit into the side of the uh, World Trade Center. The Twin Towers both gone now from the New York City uh, skyline. Um, there's another building there, we're told it's called Building 7, uh, which is in the uh, immediate neighborhood of where the uh, Twin Towers used to stand, is now on fire, and officials say it too may collapse. Uh, John Hamm uh, responding to the, uh, re the actions in uh, the United States today says that Nova Scotia is prepared to offer assistance in four areas, paramedics, medical supplies, blood, and also taking people in who need trauma help. We will continue to flash up that number of the uh, uh, blood, Canadian Blood Services throughout our uh, broadcast today because they too are looking for help uh, any time, uh, anywhere in the country that you are able to uh, donate blood. Uh, please call the number that you'll see at different times throughout the day on our screen. Uh, Premier Ham also saying that security will be beefed up on Nova Scotia's Sable natural gas pipeline because it sends energy to the U.S. echoing the kind of remarks we heard from um, Ralph Klein in Alberta earlier this afternoon, uh, wondering aloud whether he may or not uh, ask the federal government for assistance from the Canadian Army in protecting the oil fields in Alberta for the same reason. All right, reaction from uh, Quebec now. In Montreal today, uh, Premier Bernard Landry had uh, these comments to make about what has happened south of our border. There's an increase in violence, which is really jeopardizing the balance of the planet itself. These monstrous events might lead to an escalation, the result of which would be very serious for mankind as a whole. But beyond all philosophical reflections, our first consideration here must be for all the victims and for their families. Also, we must uh, think very much about the Quebecers who are in New York, in our delegation there. In the mission of Quebec in New York, we will think of them in the coming hours. Fortunately, we're able to confirm, because we're in contact with our delegation, that the 41 employees of the government of Quebec in the delegation are safe, as well as the 40 employees representing the Quebec mission. But New York 2001 and the two bodyguards who were there, the representatives of the world of business should take part in the inauguration of the mission for Quebec 2001. They're also safe. They're all safe. In Quebec, we have set up a special group 
comprising public security and the main departments concerned in services to the population. These were set up uh, by request uh, this morning, once we heard about these events, we took the necessary steps to ensure that we would be able to receive those people coming to the airport of Mirabel and also to Quebec City. A special information line was made available to the people in order to answer the most urgent questions. The number was Bernard Landry uh, talking uh, on tape there from a little while ago in Montreal, the Premier of Quebec and his reactions. The scene in New York continues to be one of devastation, the smoke pouring into the sky, the New York City skyline as we start to head into the late afternoon in New York. No aircraft in the skies, some emergency helicopters, no aircraft in the skies anywhere in the United States or Canada right now other than those that are trying to get in to, uh, to land in different airports diverted from uh, uh, heading towards the United States. And according to U.S. government spokesman, there will be no aircraft in the skies across the United States at least until noon hour tomorrow. Peter Sinjin is an uh, airport security expert. He's at the University of Manitoba in uh, Winnipeg. He joins us from our studios now in Winnipeg. Mr. Sinjin, uh, all this started as a result of hijackings of a number of different aircraft. We're still not absolutely sure how many, but we know the impact of four of them, two into the World Trade Center, uh, one into the ground in Pennsylvania that we're told was heading towards Camp David, the presidential retreat, and the fourth one into the Pentagon building, all hijacked. We had all come to some comfort thinking the days of hijackings were over. What's happened here? Well, it's a funny thing, Peter. You and I were on a plane shortly before the Air India hijack all the way to Lahr in Germany together in 1985. So I'm sure you remember it, a huge spate of hijackings in 85 and 86. We all thought that hijackings perhaps had gone away, you know, that they weren't going to happen anymore. But I'm afraid they have come to stay. And we perhaps had the most insidious and the most well-organized and the most horrendous of hijack, group hijacks that we've ever seen. Dawson's Field, you know, had four or five hijacked planes at one time in 1950. But this is far more sophisticated, far more destructive, I think, than any other hijack we've ever seen before. You know, we had a, a former pilot with American Airlines on talking to us a little while ago who uh, mm. talked about the security at Logan Airport in Boston, where at least two of these aircraft came from uh, this morning, and they were hijacked after departure from Boston. And he said that was the toughest security uh, that he'd faced anywhere, uh, and he was amazed at what he'd heard today. What does that tell us about the sophistication of those intent on hijacking aircraft, that they could have got through that kind of security? Well, um, I disagree with the pilot, first of all. I, I cross the continental United States every two months all through the year, and I found security to be very bad indeed. And I've always said that it's very bad. However, I don't want in any sense to underestimate the sophistication of this group of people and how they hijacked these planes. Um, I think they did an extraordinary job of fooling uh, the security that was in place. Perhaps they had inner collusion. They had uh, people working on airports that could have put weapons inside the plane so that they wouldn't have to carry weapons with them. Um, they've carried off the most horrendous coup I think we've ever seen in hijacking history. So it's a combination of, of surprise of Pearl Harbor surprise on the part of the Americans and of a very sophisticated network which has been able to draw on people within the United States, obviously in positions of privilege in airports if not on planes, uh, to carry out, uh, you know, a multiple hijacking rampage like this. Give us a sense when you say that you have not been impressed or you've been concerned about air airport security across the continent, why you say that? Well, um, the, we've gone through various sort of phases and stages uh, in airport security. It was a lot easier when uh, on airplanes the terrorist was ready to argue and discuss with you. And you might be able to land the plane if you agreed to his terms or if the government did. But in the age of aircraft sabotage, where there's not negotiation and where planes are used as battering rams or are exploded like Pan Am 103, there's no negotiation. It's just simply a question of, of it happening. And this is a, a whole different ball game from what it used to be. Um, this goes one degree further in that planes were stolen, hijacked, and then 
run into buildings with all the passengers inside. I don't think we've really ever seen anything quite like this attack before. It's absolutely unique and um, it's going to be very difficult to unscramble how this happened. You said, you know, it's going to take days, if not weeks, to find out who did this. You're absolutely right. It's going to take a long time, and the United States is going to have to practice extraordinary self-restraint not to want to get revenge against someone very quickly because of the justifiable anger that they feel at the moment. Well, I guess we're going to have to, to wait but to this, see whether they're this, able, able to yeah. do that. This airport security, though, is not good in the United States. It's very lax. There are um, huge uh, gaps in airport security. There, it's put aside frequently because planes are in a hurry, because pay, uh, passengers are angry and upset that they're not on time. Americans have, have come to expect a certain service in the air, and uh, you know, security has simply suffered through this whole process, you know, and that's the tragedy. It wasn't too long ago uh, mm -hmm. after uh, an incident in the United States when, uh, during the Clinton administration when Al Gore was put in charge of re-looking at the whole security issue in the United States and whether it was going to need to be stepped up and what extra mm -hmm. precautions mm -hmm. were going to have to take place. Um, one assumes, no matter how one may uh, uh, judge the changes that were made after that, uh, that Americans and uh, North Americans, for that matter, are in for much more severe changes as a result of what just happened today. I think this is an absolute turning point. I don't think that airport security or security is ever going to be the same thing again. And I think we're going to have to rethink the system from the bottom up. Um, I talked to the Senate uh, Terrorism Committee in Canada a couple of years ago about this and recommended a whole new skin of airport security, as I call it. And they were very interested at that time, but they didn't make any steps to implement that. But of course, with 532 airports in, in the United States, it's going to take a lot of organizing to change the whole face of human security. You know, and uh, it's going to be a big job. And I think the Americans, when they recover from all this, are suddenly going to realize that they really are vulnerable and that uh, you've got to have good airport security within the continental United States. The terrorists can reach right in there and, and carry out something like this. I mean, it's extraordinary. It's shattering. It's, uh, it's destroyed all our illusions of safety, you know, and of the safety of North America. From now on, it's a different game. We're going to have to embrace proper security, no more rent-a-cops, but proper security at airports. Now, and I you, believe Canada's involved in this too. Do you really think, given the uh, sophistication that we assume was involved in this one, and it, it's apparent that uh, there obviously was a high level of sophistication, mm -hmm. plus a, a, a dedication that uh, was willing to, obviously, uh, you know, for the hijackers to give up their lives in, in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in going ahead with their cause, given all that, do you really think there's any level of security that could have prevented something like this? Well. You know, um, that's a very good question, and, and obviously you would expect the answer to be no, you can't get away from such security. But the other side of this whole thing, Peter, is that if you believe that this is a sort of combination of the Palestinian issue and the bin Laden organization, the bin Laden money, along with the Palestinian expertise, demonstrated over many years in hijacking an airport's uh, 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 sabotage, then, uh, you know, maybe only a political solution is going to work. Uh, on these terrorist attacks. I mean, in Pan Am 103, it was impossible to stop what happened on Pan Am 103. There was no way of stopping it. And I've always said that the Palestinians have caused over 60% of the major hijack and terrorist activities in the last 25 years. And this issue keeps with us. It goes on and on and on. It's never resolved. And uh, to a degree, yes, you can get through any security. You can always mount a surprise attack like this. But I'm just saying that the whole security system uh, could include intelligence, not just simply physical barriers to intelligence. And uh, intelligence is knowing who's going to strike where and when. And obviously, intelligence really messed up on this because there was no warning at all on the continental United States, whereas a warning, I understand, had been issued on Friday for Asia and Europe. And you have to go public with these warnings when they look really serious. And so the United States didn't have any warning. It's, it's just like Pearl Harbor. They just sat there and it happened. Uh, there had to be evidence. There had to be activities that were unusual. Um, security was really caught sleeping. So the answer to your question is ambiguous, of course. Yes, human security has got to be drastically improved throughout North America. But yes, maybe a political solution is one of the ways to stop these kinds of horrible revenge activities from happening. All right, final point. Um 
Give us a snapshot if you can. If you had your way, how would you see the security of the future at airports? Well, uh, when I spoke to the Senate committee, I suggested that we copy a system that's working in Malaysia at the present time. And that is a system where they no longer have rent-a-cops, but they have uh, paid political employees who are uh, increasingly experts in security, and uh, they are paid money to find hijackers or arms or things like that, and they are given promotions to different airports around the country for doing a really good job. And the result of these people being well paid and really knowing about security is that the whole level of security in every airport in Malaysia has just shot up. And you begin to have a really good system of security throughout the human communities and airports. And this is where the reform is needed. If you get somebody, a group like this, really driving security, they're going to make all the various human communities, from cafes and gift shops and everything else, aware of the possibilities uh, of, of, of hijacking and of security. And they're going to warn them against lapses in security, which are very easy to make in airports, because they're great big international cities these days. And I think that that's something we should emulate. We should spend the money on proper preventative security, not after the event reaction to a horrendous episode. And this is always our reaction. It's a Canadian reaction. It's an American reaction. We react to things we don't think ahead that this might thing might happen in advance. We, I mean, we should have the political imagination to know with a war going on between the Palestinians and the Israelis that something like this might have happened against the United States. Superpowers and great powers have always been attacked throughout history. It was just a question of time before a really serious attack from abroad was going to be mounted on the United States. Now it's happened and we better start thinking it through and, 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 and seeing if we can prevent a thing like that from happening again, whether it's political solutions or whether it's security solutions or whether it's both. All right. We're going to have to leave it there. Peter Sinjin joining us from uh, our studios in Winnipeg, uh, an uh, expert on airport security uh, from the University of Manitoba. We thank you for your time. Nice to speak to you, Peter. All right. All right. Also in uh, Winnipeg, just a short time ago, the uh, Premier of Manitoba reacting to this horrific scene in uh, New York City and in Washington today. Here's uh, comments from Premier Gary Dewar. just want to make a uh, short statement uh, First of all, on behalf of all Manitobans, uh, I want to condemn the barbaric and cowardly act of terrorism that uh, uh, was conducted today throughout the United States and offer the condolences of Manitobans to the families uh, of the uh, innocent victims and the emergency personnel that were put at risk and lost life and limb today. Uh, secondly, uh, we have, and I've personally been in touch with the mayor, our offices have been in touch with the U.S. government and the federal government. I've discussed the uh, ongoing situation with the Leader of the Opposition, uh, and I just had a briefing session with uh, the Department of Justice, representatives of the Department of Justice and the Emergency Measures Organization. In terms of the Department of Justice, we are uh, obviously uh, keeping in touch with the RCMP uh, and the federal government on any potential risks uh, and uh, taking uh, the pro proper protocols and precautions if we feel there are any risks here in Manitoba. Uh, secondly, in terms of the Emergency Measures Organization, uh, we have opened up our operations office for communication purposes. Uh, we obviously have experience uh, on a large number of people that have been evacuated from uh, centers in the last flood, for example, 40,000 people. Uh, the Emergency Measures Organization is working with other municipalities, with the City of Winnipeg, and with the Airport Authority on the most immediate issue that we have in front of us, and that is the evacuation or the location and uh, reallocation of flights to Winnipeg. Uh, this morning we were alerted to uh, a number of flights being allocated to Winnipeg, uh, re redirected to Manitoba and to Canada, and to, therefore to Winnipeg. Uh, we were initially given an upward number of 60, uh, then we were given an upward number of 80 potential flights. Uh, at this point, uh, we have 14 domestic flights and three international flights. Uh, the three international flights have uh, approximately 600 passengers uh, that are located at the Winnipeg Airport Authority. And uh, having discussed this with the mayor, we are going to work in close cooperation with the City of Winnipeg and the Airport Authority on the people that have been diverted to Manitoba and to Winnipeg. Uh, there's a great deal of anxiety, obviously, at the airport. Uh, people there do not know and we can't tell them yet 
uh, what the uh, expected situation is for domestic flights or the international flights, and to not know is to, uh, is, is to not be certain. Uh, we haven't been informed by the uh, NAV Canada or the federal government yet on the, uh, the follow-up plans. They're, they're acting out, uh, out of an abundance of caution, and I know that that will create a great deal of anxiety at the airport. Uh, for individuals that uh, do not know exactly when uh, they can go home. Uh, having said that, we will put in place whatever we can. Uh, on a final point, I just want to say to people in Manitoba that uh, uh, certainly the Canadian Blood Agency is calling on donations of blood, and I would urge all Manitobans to consider that as one act of showing our, uh, our deep, deep uh, anguish of, uh, of the events that have happened today. Gary. Premier Gary Dewar speaking in uh, Winnipeg a short time ago about uh, Manitoba's reaction to the events that we've witnessed here south of the border, both in New York, uh, the pictures you're looking at now, these are live shots, also in Washington where there have been uh, uh, a hijacked plane slammed into the Pentagon building, a uh, small uh, bomb exploded outside the State Department, and a, another aircraft that had been, we're told, uh, directed towards uh, uh, Camp David, the presidential retreat, uh, ended up crashing in Pennsylvania, a couple of hundred miles away from Camp David. Why it crashed there, what happened that led to the crash, we're not exactly sure. Um, but uh, we're still, obviously, all uh, media organizations working on that. Uh, security precautions being taken, obviously, across the United States. No air traffic uh, until at least noon tomorrow. Uh, across Canada, airports uh, uh, in a similar state where many uh, Canadian airports now, uh, uh, many... Uh, International aircraft destined for the United States have been diverted and are sitting on tarmacs. Inside airport buildings, there are uh, a number of uh, different um, uh, situations going on. We saw from Terry Malusky's report the RCMP uh, sniffer dogs uh, in the Vancouver airport and the Toronto airport were told uh, uh, um, camouflage. Uh, officers, either Army or police officers, patrolling the areas in Pearson International Airport, uh, areas around Parliament Hill uh, are being closed uh, away from uh, tourists, number of offices, embassies closed and evacuated in different uh, parts of the country. Um, NATO officials on high alert across uh, Western Europe, that uh, obviously involves Can Canada as well as uh, members of uh, NATO. NORAD, which is uh, the joint uh, Canada-U.S. operation to protect North America, is also on high alert at this hour. Um, we can also, let me show you something here. Uh, this will be happening in cities across the uh, across this continent, if not across the world. Uh, it's rare that we've had uh, afternoon editions of papers, but this is a story unlike any that we've seen in our world. Here's the uh, Toronto Star, late afternoon edition, first time in years, just come out an extra America under attack, and the. Uh, images uh, taken shortly after the second aircraft went into one of the uh, uh, towers of the uh, uh, building at the World Trade Center. Also the Toronto Sun also putting out a special edition, America Under Attack. Uh, this happening uh, around the world and certainly around this country right now. Updating you on the situation of the U.S. President whose uh, whereabouts we've been tracking all day. He was in Florida earlier today for uh, an education speech when suddenly this event happened. He was whisked away from Sarasota, Florida, ended up in Louisiana at a U.S. Air Force base, then was taken to uh, Omaha, Nebraska, uh, where uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, he has been in a bunker there conducting a, a special security meeting. We're now told that he is preparing to leave uh, Nebraska for a destination uh, unknown. That is a report coming out of uh, uh, out of the pool group of uh, uh, reporters who are covering the U.S. president this hour. Um, Henry Champ joins us once again from uh, Washington. Henry, uh, with that news, watching Karen Hughes just a, a short time ago with her uh, uh, remarks, what can you piece together as to how uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, administration, specifically the White House, is trying to deal with this at this hour? Well, I think uh, the teleconference uh, is clearly over. They would not have been leaving that area unless that had been completed. So undoubtedly, uh, some order is uh, being brought in into the issue. The uh, CIA, the FBI, all the key elements uh, have had their say with the president. And undoubtedly, there is a battle plan, so to speak, uh, in place. 
you get the feeling that, uh, although with a great deal of uncertainty, that the chatter that you and I talked about about the president's position at this particular time may be attended to. The pool was told to get back to Air Force One in Omaha as quickly as possible. It is taking off. There is no location. Uh, but uh, getting back to that issue of the president's whereabouts, it must be pointed out that uh, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, the former president of the United States, uh, caught up, uh, our Associated Press caught up with him. He was asked about the president's location, and he sided with uh, George Bush and the uh, secur uh, security arrangements, saying he, the president he's referring to, needs to take every conceivable precaution in the event there are more attacks planned, and there is a plan to attack the leadership uh, of the United States, Clinton saying that in an interview uh, uh, just uh, a, sh a short time ago. All right. uh, but all right, Henry. But uh, we have no word whether he's returning to Washington or what his destination is, Peter. Okay, that's great. Um, uh, Bush uh, said to be leaving then uh, Omaha, and it, w what is clear, we don't know where he's going, but it's clear that they're keeping him on the move. He never seems to be in, in one place too long. He was in Louisiana for uh, a couple of hours at most, and he now uh, is in, uh, was been in Omaha for the last couple of hours. We're now being told, just being told now, that he is now on his way back or is about to be on his way back uh, to Washington, coming in uh, from Omaha. And we'll have to uh, uh, obviously make judgments about what that means. In fact, yes, it's now been officially announced he is returning uh, to the White House. Now, whether that uh, means that the security officials that uh, are around the president feel that the security threat is now, uh, has now dropped from where it was a little while ago, or whether it's being decided uh, for any number of reasons, including political ones, that he should be returning to Washington is still yet to be determined. One assumes the American people will be hearing from their president later tonight. Uh, but we don't know that with any certainty. Uh, but it w certainly wouldn't surprise us, and I know, Henry, it wouldn't uh, surprise you either if uh, by the time he gets back to Washington that he's not appearing uh, at 8 or 9 o'clock tonight, uh, Washington time, uh, in a full address to the nation. I'd certainly expect that, and I think we should say, and I sh I'm sure you agree with me here, it's entirely possible that in Nebraska the president ordered his security people to take him back to Washington. After all, he's a politician, and he understands the issues of appearance and, and the gravitas of the situation. But uh, it is a, a fact that Washington is abuzz about the fact that he's not here at the moment. All right. Henry Tramp reporting to us from Washington. And Henry will be back uh, to you again. We are told that in about seven or eight minutes' time, we should have a news conference from the uh, uh, commissioner of the RCMP in Ottawa about overall Canadian security matters uh, as it relates to uh, what we have seen unfolded in the United States today. Uh, we will, of course, be going there live when that news conference begins. Uh, throughout this day today, you've been seeing the pictures that have been shot by U.S. network television uh, of the events that happened, especially in New York, but also in Washington. Uh, amateur video is now starting to appear uh, of uh, the uh, immediate aftermath of the devastating uh, strikes on the World Trade Center in uh, in Washington or in New York City. I'm sorry. Uh, let's roll some of that uh, amateur video now to give you a sense of uh, of what happened there in the moments immediately after the uh, destruction of these buildings. I hope I live. I hope I live. It's coming down on me. Here it comes. I'm getting behind a car. It's uh, incredible. Okay, I'm going to have to go find people who need help. Because I don't think I'm one of them. You okay, sir? Okay. Can I just get a toot off your respirator? Yeah. Can I get a toot? I'm seeing a couple of clean breaths. Can you Hello, Doc. Hey, that guy needs some oxygen. If someone can share it with him. 10-4. Thanks. Once again, this video was shot by an amateur uh, cameraman. In New York City, you can hear his commentary, stunning, watching that building coming down, his concerns for his own life, and immediately then redirecting his energies to, to others who may need help. Let's listen in. Am I safe in here? Can help? Can help? 
seen some people who needed oxygen from the dust. No point trauma. Gonna go wash my eyes out. Yeah, that almost made it work. Looking north on the west side highway. You guys going in? Yeah. Come with you. You know, you might not want to get too much closer because the more buildings that come down, then we're not going to help anybody. All right. I think we should. Yeah. Where's the incident come out? Let's just stay. Yeah, okay. Let's just wait right here. Let's just station up right here, okay? All right, Doc. Why don't we set up? Can you hang IVs from this pole here? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We just heard another explosion. They're handing out gloves and masks. The consensus is it's too unsafe to go in there. Just going to wait here until they bring some people out. hooked up with some firemen with some first aid stuff. Remarkable video taken by a, a doctor uh, who was part of the uh, medical teams that were dispatched to that area before the building collapsed and then following its collapse you saw, you witnessed uh, how they were trying to get near the area where clearly there are uh, many, many, many casualties. Uh, buildings, the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, normally can hold 50,000 people on a normal work day. How many were there at this time, we do not know. And it is going to be days, weeks before we know. This is the National Press Building in Ottawa now, uh, where in a few moments' time we expect the uh, Commissioner of the RCMP to hold a uh, uh, news conference. We're told uh, they're running a bit late, uh, so we'll uh, keep our eyes on this uh, scene in Ottawa. Um, do we have access to... Uh, Don Newman in uh, the nation's capital. Uh, uh, we'll get to Don uh, shortly, I hope. And uh, but meanwhile, we can go to uh, uh, Premier Gordon Campbell of British Columbia. We've been hearing from premiers across the country um, today in terms of their reaction. Uh, Premier Bernard Lord of, B of New Brunswick. Well, there's Don. We'll get to him in a second. Uh, Premier uh, Bernard Lord was uh, uh, in New York today. Um, now, I'm not sure whether we are connected. Are we or are we not connected to Don Newman? Well, we're still working on that. We'll get back to it. Premier Bernard Lord was in uh, New, uh, was in New York City uh, today. We heard from him. Uh, Premier Gordon Campbell in British Columbia's two sons were in New York today. He heard about this by his sons calling him to tell him he was okay. They were okay. Uh, here's Premier Campbell's remarks uh, a short time ago. This on tape from uh, either Victoria or Vancouver. Premier Gordon Campbell of BC. I was spared a lot of anxiety because he was the messenger of what had happened, but. Uh I think that uh, I can tell you both Nancy and I were, it shakes you up to think that uh, your sons are there. And you have to remember that there's thousands of families that know that their sons and their daughters and their husbands and their wives are there and have been impacted. And in, you know, in the midst of this horrific act of hatred, which is done for one reason, that's to spawn more hatred and more fear and more division. Uh, you know, there still are incredible acts of human courage. You watch the police officers, and the firefighters, and the volunteers who are trying to do nothing except for serve those people who are there at the Trade Center who are trying to protect them. And, you know, I'm sure there are, unfortunately, hundreds of those people that have lost their lives because they were trying to reach out and help too. Can you tell us what um, Jeff said to you and, if, if, and also Nicholas? It's incomprehensible. It's like something that was never supposed to happen. Uh, and my first thoughts, obviously, were, you know, how, how are the boys? The boys were fine. Uh, they phoned to say they were fine. You know, well-trained kids, they phoned and said, we're okay. Uh, but, you know, it's, 
it's staggering. My son Nicholas is visiting. Je Jeffrey works in New York, but my son Nicholas is visiting. And uh, it was really after their call that I, you know, you start thinking, well, you know, what does a visitor to New York do? They go to the World Trade Towers. You know, they go up to the observation deck. They look around. What does a visitor in New York do when they're trying to avoid the lineups? They go to the World Trade Towers early so they can get up to the obs observation decks to look. Premier Gordon Campbell uh, speaking from British Columbia today, uh, having found out about the uh, attacks on uh, the uh, cities of New York and Washington from his sons who are in New York. One works there and the other was visiting uh, there today. Uh, across this country, uh, people are flooding the response lines of the Canadian Blood Services to offer uh, blood donations. We'll continue to flash that number up on the screen uh, to let you know if you want to call to find out where uh, you can donate blood um, if you are so willing. But there are many responses coming through. Uh, we heard earlier there has not been a direct request yet from the United States, but they are expecting one. There's the number, one 236 Now, uh, we have now managed to connect with Don Newman in Ottawa, who's been uh, monitoring reaction in, the, in this country and especially on Parliament Hill. Uh, Don, we're expecting a... Uh, a statement from the Commissioner of the RCMP in a few moments' time, but there seem to have been statements from everyone from the Prime Minister on down in the last little while. Yes, and by and large, of course, as you would expect, Peter, expressing uh, shock, dismay, uh, outrage, and offering prayers and condolences to the Americans and also offering help if that help is needed. And as you point out, uh, blood at least is going to be needed and probably some other things as well. Uh, people are working through in their own minds here uh, just what has happened. A parliament is not sitting. The Prime Minister is having breakfast with Saskatchewan Premier Lorne, uh, Lorne Calvert out at his residence at 24 Sussex Drive. Uh, the uh, Premier was just leaving. The Prime Minister, someone said to him, uh, there's been some kind of a disaster, some kind of a plane crash in New York. Uh, the Prime Minister went and uh, turned on the TV to find out what was going on. And lo and behold, there was a second plane crash as well. And that's how the Prime Minister uh, first found out what was going on. Uh, he stayed at 24 Sussex Drive. He was on the phone with uh, the Commissioner of the RCMP. He was also on with the head of CSIS, uh, with the Chief of the Defence Staff, General Haino, and with some of his Cabinet Ministers. Uh, the other MPs, by and large, not in the city today. Uh, Joe Clark out in Edmonton, uh, putting out a statement from there. Stockwell Day, uh, not in the city either, putting out a statement as well. And uh, even Alexa McDonough, who uh, had an interesting statement saying that uh, she hoped there would be a peaceful resolution of all of this. Uh, not entirely clear, Peter, how that will work out because that hasn't been the pattern before and one would assume uh, public opinion in the United States is going to demand something more than a peaceful resolution in all of this. But what we know officially, at least, is uh, that Commissioner Zaccardelli will be holding a news conference in just a couple of minutes now, we think. And then there's nothing else official in Ottawa for the rest of the evening unless uh, there are new developments in this story. At the moment, uh, Foreign Affairs Minister John Manley, who was coming from Frankfurt to Toronto on a direct uh, Air Canada flight, was diverted. He's not back yet. No plans for a cabinet meeting uh, tomorrow. The other thing, of course, that's been going on here in New Retire, where we were listening to the Premier of BC, uh, people here, of course, uh, a lot of people have friends and relatives in, uh, in New York uh, working and living there. And uh, I phoned a friend of mine whose son works there to make sure he'd got the 1-800 uh, number that we had uh, up on the screen uh, to call if you had uh, relatives in New York. Uh, but uh, very fortunately, again, uh, his son was already uh, in touch and had been safe, uh, did not live all that far from the World Trade Center and was moving very quickly north, uh, probably in those shots of people we saw hurrying up the streets away from uh, the World Trade Center. Do you have any indication at this time what we should expect from the Commissioner of the RCMP? I think he will tell us that uh, there is additional security in our country, uh, that uh, he does not think that we are in any kind of imminent threat, and the Canadians should uh, not be uh, concerned in that regard. But he will say that there is heightened security, and he will say that uh, any cooperation the Americans want, of course, uh, that uh, the RCMP will be very willing to provide. Remember, it was, what, uh, just at the Millennium New Year that uh, the, uh, the uh, Canadian, uh, the person coming from Canada into the United States across from uh, Victoria, uh, was apprehended. So there's been a lot of concern uh, in the security community here about whether or not Canada has been a staging area for terrorists. The other interesting thing, you know, Peter, there's been a lot of calls in the last year or so for let's make the border more open. It takes too long to go across uh, the border with NAFTA and all the uh, travel that goes back and forth. My sense is that in the short term anyway, and maybe the long term as well, 
it's going to take longer to go over the border. It's not going to get easier to go over the border. And some of these uh, smart cards and other things that have been used to get across the border, I think the Americans will be reviewing that. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, you're certainly right today, as we've seen the pictures from uh, various uh, border crossings, not surprisingly, uh, where at times they were closed today, but they are all open now, but the traffic through there is very slow. And if you are uh, heading by car uh, towards the United States, uh, expect long delays and expect a vigorous examination of both your vehicle and your documents uh, when you get to any uh, border crossing. All right, Don, thanks very much. We'll talk to you again. Uh, yeah, Peter, I think, I think yeah. we're 15 seconds away from the RCMP commissioner, I'm told. All right. So, um, well, let's have a look. In fact, in if the, we look uh, live into that uh, news conference room, as you are wont to do, yeah, you're there, right he on. there he there is. There he is, the commissioner of the RCMP, Commissioner Zaccadelli. Let's hear his remarks. Presse. Aujourd'hui, nous avons avec nous Monsieur Giuliano Zaccardelli, qui est commissaire à la GRC. Uh, we have with us this afternoon Mr. Giuliano Zaccardelli, who is commissioner of, of RCMP. Uh, Monsieur Zaccardelli va faire quelques remarques pendant quelques minutes, et ensuite uh, je vais ouvrir une période de questions. Nous avons au total seulement 20 minutes, alors je serai très strict. Je ne prendrai qu'une qu question Only par personne, question même pas de supplémentaire. Individual, no supplementary. And I would ask all of you, please. Please to turn off your cell phones. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Bon après-midi, mesdames et messieurs. Uh, first of all, I would like to offer my condolences to the American people for the tragic events that have taken place today. Obviously, uh, this is a reminder to all of us around the world of uh, the tragedy that can befall any place in the world when terrorists uh, decide to act against democratic countries or uh, people of the world. Uh, we have taken certain measures, obviously, in reacting to this situation as it has evolved today here in Canada to ensure that we provide the best possible security to the citizens of this country. I would now like to uh, open the floor for discussions or for questions. Je suis prêt à répondre à vos questions aujourd'hui. I'm not prepared Alors, to answer any questions you might have. Manon First of all, Manon Le Cornelier, Mr. Mr. Zaccarelli, you said that you've taken some steps. Could we have an idea what these steps are? Have some steps been taken at the request of the American authorities with respect to the surveillance of certain groups or information on certain groups? Well, as to our cooperation with the U.S., of course, we're always in contact with the U.S. We work very well with them. We are prepared. We have offered our assistance. We are exchanging intelligence, and we are working very closely with the U.S. We do that on a daily basis, and we have improved that cooperation as of today. The question as to the measures that have been taken here in Canada, of course, there are some places where there are some Americans. There are other countries that are here as well. There are buildings and places that must be protected. We are prepared to provide the protection required to meet the needs of these embassies and consulates, for example. So we have taken some steps, and we are not going to minimize the, the seriousness of the threat. We are going to deal with the threat that exists. Radio Canada. I would like to know what you're doing in terms of security of the country and at the borders. Is the RCMP involved in that? Yes, we are involved because we work with customs, we work with immigration, we also work with the Americans at the border. That is something that we do all of the time, but once again, we sat down together today to see that the measures in place are the appropriate ones and to see whether there are ways of improving that cooperation. That is something that we always do together. The important thing is to get the intelligence, to get the best possible intelligence so that we can better respond to any threat. Are there any forces in, in the... We have in, in the field, yes, we have uh, informed police officers and customs officers. We're working together. There are investigators that are there to uh, respond if there is a need. Sun Media, sorry. Do we have a place like Nebraska that we would take our prime minister in a case like this? And is there a higher sec security measure or alert that we are put on, like a uh, War Measures Act, something along that line? Should that ever happen? And has that been considered? Who would make that decision? Uh, what we do in this country is we respond 
to the threat that exists. So we have to have, you have information and you do a threat assessment on the information and then you provide the appropriate security to respond to that threat. That's what we do in all cases. And obviously the authorities, the police authorities, the security authorities, the other agencies that are responsible for providing enforcement and work in that area, they work together in a collaborative way. So we do a threat assessment and then provide the security that responds to that threat assessment. But is there a place that, we, that the Prime Minister goes to, similar to Mr. Bush, and is there some kind of a, a higher security, like a red code or something that Canada would be put on? As required, obviously, we ensure, first and foremost, that our Prime Minister is secure and, and he is moved depending on the threat assessment, but that is the way we do it. The threat assessment determines what type of security measures we take for the appropriate authorities. Uh, but Sorry, Anne, I have to go. Um, Val Valerie Lawton from Toronto Star. Um, just wonder, Commissioner, if you can tell us whatever you know about the situation in White Horse and the two Korean planes that yeah. were brought down there. Yeah. The two Korean planes are on the ground in White Horse. We have responded, the RCMP has responded to those two situations. Our emergency response teams are there on the ground. They've secured the planes. They are in contact and in discussions with the pilots. And so they are in the process of uh, determining what action to be taken. And so that is an ongoing and active investigation that is evolving as we speak. Anything else about what the situation was? Well, we are in the process of trying to determine that. That's We are actually in active discussions with the pilots to determine what to do here at this point in time. Suzanne Wallet, Radio, Radio, Radio Canada. Two points, first of all. When you say that you've increased security, what were your priorities? And when you talk about the contacts, the intelligence contacts that you have with the U.S., are we talking about trying to find the origin of this? Of course, when we talk about the American embassy, we have to ensure that that we have to look at what happened, we've looked at, we have assessed the threat, and we have increased some of our security measures. There are some dignitaries who are here in town and in the country, and we have assessed the threat against those individuals, and we have put in place the appropriate security measures to respond to that threat, and we're in constant contact with the U.S., first of all, to ensure that uh, there is an exchange of intelligence and to offer all possible assistance to our American neighbors. There are still some fears about planes arriving. Yes, there are fears about planes arriving, but uh, we are reviewing the situation. As I said, we are in contact with the pilots of the aircraft, and the investigation is ongoing at the moment. Um, the last time there was a terrorist uh, threat or, or an attempted terrorist strike in the U.S. during the 2000 Millennial Celebrations, it was revealed that the terrorists involved were using Canada as a gateway or, or as an entry point into the U.S. Understandably, it's early now, but do you have any evidence um, or have you gathered any intelligence that shows that that was the case this time? In other words, that the, the terrorist attacks, um, that the U.S. was infiltrated through Canada and that maybe some of the terrorist cells that operate or run their operations out of Canada were involved? Well, as you know, terrorism is an international problem. It is not a, an American or Canadian or North American problem. It's an international problem. And uh, at, at this point in time, I'm not in a position to say whether there is any relationship to Canada, other than, as I said, we have taken the necessary precaution to respond to the possible threat that might exist. Bob Five, National Post. Commissioner, I've noticed that the, the, uh, the head of the CSIS has not been involved in any of the discussions, um, and I want to know why uh, that would not be, why he would not be involved, why Mr. Ward wouldn't, Altrock wouldn't be involved. And secondly of all, uh, are you uh, ruling out categorically at this point that there's no evidence whatsoever or any indication whatsoever that any terrorist uh, may have been used Canada as a staging ground for these attacks in the United States? Uh, 
As a police officer, I don't rule out any possibility. In terms of the agencies that are working on this, I can assure you that all agencies in Canada that have anything to do with criminal acts or terror acts are involved. So I can assure you that we are cooperating collaboratively, not only the, the, t the organization that you refer to, but also Transport Canada, all the other agencies that have a role to play, immigration, uh, customs, and so on. Uh, we are all actively working together to, to ensure that we provide the best security to Canadians and also to collaborate as best as we can and assist our, our obviously our allies in the United States and elsewhere. Daniel Leblanc, Globe and Mail. Do you have a sense of what can happen over the next hours, over the next days and whether the, what's the state of the threats and uh, whether they'll escalate or... Uh, obviously, that's a very difficult uh, question to answer, but I can assure you we are doing everything possible to gather the very best intelligence so that we can use that intelligence.